Well, we are going to um, come now into God's Word. We're going to hear it, uh, a Bible reading soon from, uh, we've got two readings today, Habakkuk uh, 2 and Romans 1, 8 to 17. So before um, Bruce comes to read and Alex comes to preach, I might just pray for us. Father God, it is uh, uh, good to be here and it is wonderful that uh, we have your Word. Thank you that you have revealed yourself uh, and your great plans and purposes uh, in the Scriptures. And we thank you that we can uh, hear them now read and preached. Please soften our hearts uh, to hear your Word by your Spirit um, and work your Word deeply into us. Change us, transform us by uh, your Word today for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Sometimes a summary of something could be helpful. It might be the novelist summarising her novel at the end of the book, or it may be a speaker summarising his message at the end of his talk. And in today's Bible reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, we have in effect a little summary. In his letter, Paul explains in some detail the Gospel and in two verses of chapter 1, 16 and 17, we have a little summary. 
And that's what I'd like to think about with you this morning. But first, let's listen again to the summary. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, Paul here uh, has made three main statements, and I'd like to unpack them a bit. And the statements are these. One, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Two, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And three, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Let's take these three statements one at a time. Firstly then, I am not ashamed of the gospel. The word gospel comes from the old English, God's spell. And spell uh, is a Saxon word meaning story. And so gospel is God's story. Gospel translates the Greek evangel, which meant Good news proclaimed to people. For example, in those days, if a, a messenger brought news from a war that the decisive battle had been won, it was called the evangel, the good news. So in effect, Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the good news of God's story, the good news of what God has done, the good news of what God has done for us and for our salvation. The good news from God concerning his son, Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now, just before he said that, he'd written these words. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also in Rome. Paul realised that because the Lord Jesus had sent him, he, he was, in effect, under obligation, a happy one, to... Uh, preach the gospel to people no matter who they were or where they were. But in addition to that, he was eager and keen to preach the gospel because he was not ashamed of it or embarrassed by it. If he had been, uh, then he wouldn't be eager to preach it. He'd be reluctant. Let me tell you a little personal story that I'm not eager to tell <laughs> because I'm embarrassed about a part of it. When I was ministering in the Anglican parish of Strathalbyn, uh, I was to take a wedding in the church at Meadows, which was about a 20 minute drive from Strathalbyn. And when I drove up to the church to unlock it for the arrival of the wedding party, to my shock, I discovered that I'd left the keys to the church back in the rectory at Strath. And then the groom's car suddenly arrived and I made a quick calculation that it would take me 20 minutes to go back and 20 minutes to get back to Meadows and by that time no doubt there'd be lots of people standing outside the church wondering why they couldn't get in. I was embarrassed to tell him about this. So I turned to Cheryl and I said something like, uh, tell you what, dear, why don't you go and tell the groom what's happened <laughs> while well, I go back and get the keys? No way, she rightly said. Well, as I approached the groom, I noticed he had a dark circle under his eye. And he said to me, you'll never guess what's happened to me. And he proceeded to tell me that that very morning he'd been playing tennis and a ball had gone into his eye. And I said to him, and you'll never guess what's just happened to me. <laughs> now, if you're not embarrassed or ashamed of something, uh, then you're happy to talk about it. You may even be keen to talk about it. Paul was not ashamed or embarrassed of the gospel, but eager to talk about it. Why? And that brings us on to his second statement. 
because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Suppose that you were suffering from a certain sickness, but you were told of a cure and found that it worked. Uh, you wouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed, would you, to tell others about the cure? And Paul knew that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. He knew it could cure people's sickness, spiritual sickness. Now the Romans in Paul's day worshipped the God of power. And I guess we too live in an age of power, don't we? There are all sorts of power. There's nuclear, solar, wind, political power, military power. But there's another power too. It's the power of God. And indeed, the word power in the Greek could be translated dynamite. I'm not ashamed of the power, the dynamite of God, because it is, of the gospel, because it is the power and dynamite of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And so the gospel is not like a damp squid. It's not a weak thing. The power of God is packed in this gospel. Now, solar power is the power of the sun for heating and lighting. Military power is the power of the military for defending and attacking. Government power or political power is the power of the government for managing the country. What is the gospel the power of God for? In one word, salvation of everyone who believes. Salvation. There's no other power that can bring you that. The power of money can't. The power of science can't. The power of government can't. But the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. In the Bible, the word salvation refers primarily to being saved from spiritual danger for spiritual safety and well-being. Sometimes on a beach, there might be a sign, it's a warning sign, like danger. Beware of rips, don't swim here. But if a person ignores that, disobeys that warning, and goes for a swim, he's inviting disaster. Man was warned by God in the garden, lovingly warned, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall die. Man disobeyed, and disaster has followed. But, in his love, grace, and mercy, God sent his one and only Son into this world to save us, that we might live through him. This is how God showed his love among us. Salvation is to be saved from and four, saved from being in the wrong with God, for being in the right with God. Saved from spiritual death, for spiritual life, eternal life. Saved from guilt, for goodness. From the penalty of sin, for the pardon of sin. From the power of sin for the purpose of living now for Jesus. From hell for heaven. And one day from the presence of sin for the perfection of being like Jesus. The sign outside a church read man's way leads to a hopeless end. God's way leads to an endless hope. And God's way is Jesus, who claims, I am 
the way. Salvation leads to Jesus. That's God's way. But for whom is the gospel the power of God for salvation? And we're here told everyone who believes or to everyone who has faith. Now, suppose there was a certain medicine that had the power to save anyone from a fatal sickness. Then it will save everyone who hears about it and takes it. And the gospel is the power of God for everyone who believes. A man went to his doctor and said, It's been one month since my last visit and I still feel miserable. The doctor replied, did you follow the instructions on the medicine I gave you? The man answered, I sure did. The bottle said, keep tightly closed. <laughs> now the gospel is the power of God for salvation, but that doesn't mean that everyone will automatically save. Like medicine that can heal, it needs to be taken. And the qualification here is, to everyone who has faith, to everyone who believes. And faith is like the hand of the heart reaching up to take Jesus. It is a real trusting in the Lord Jesus and what he's done on that cross on our behalf and for our salvation. I rest my faith in him and him alone who died for my transgressions to atone, says an old hymn, puts it well. Someone has said, if you have an accident, you qualify for an ambulance. If you have a cancer, you qualify for a hospital. And if you're a sinner, you qualify for a saviour. And every sinner who believes finds that the gospel is the power of God to save him or her. So it doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated, civilised or uncivilised, respectable or unrespectable, rich, poor, black or white. The gospel can work for anyone who believes. You don't have to be a certain type. And looking around, we're not all the same type. And yet we who believe are finding the gospel is the power of God to save us. Now then Paul adds, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Well, the world back then was divided into these two broad categories, Jew and Gentile and non-Jew. God chose one nation of all the nations to be his special channel of blessing to the others. Abraham was the founding father of the Jews and in Genesis 12 we hear what God told Abraham. In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And it was from the family tree of Abraham that Jesus eventually came to be the saviour of the world. And God revealed the gospel first to the Jews because he wanted them to have the first opportunity to believe. But when the Jews turned the gospel down, Paul and the others turned to the Gentiles in fulfilment of what God had foretold through the prophet Isaiah about the Messiah. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And that includes ourselves. So now the Jew has no advantage over the Gentile. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, Jew or Gentile. But why is the gospel the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes? And that brings us on to the third statement that Paul makes. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. 
The, the New Living Translation simplifies those words by saying, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. Now, supposing a person has done wrong and broken the law and in due course is brought before the judge, if the judge just lets him off when he has broken the law, then that would put the judge in the wrong. And if God just lets people off who has broken his law, if he just forgives sinners without anything else, that would put him in the wrong. It might put you and I in the right, but God would be in the wrong. How can God put you and I in the right and still be in the right himself? Or, putting it another way, how can God both punish and pardon? How can God be both just and merciful? The answer is in three words, by the cross. So let's take the word cross, and the last two letters of the word cross may help us. SS, S for satisfaction and S for substitution. In relation to the law of God, the cross was a satisfaction. And in relation to the sinner, the cross is a substitution. In relation to the law, the cross is a satisfaction. I'll just share a little illustration I came across that may help us here. Imagine a court in which a helpless woman, abandoned by her husband, is found guilty and fined heavily or three months in prison. She has no money and she cannot bear the thought of parting from her children, so she pleads with the judge for mercy. But the judge cannot disregard the demands of justice. And he says, you have broken the law and the sentence must stand. But then he takes out his checkbook and he writes a check to pay the woman's fine. He has in one gesture met the demands of both justice and mercy. The penalty has been paid, but the guilty party walks out of court free. And that is a picture of the way God has solved the problem. At the cross, divine justice was satisfied. The price of sin was paid in full. It is finished, Jesus declared. And the sinner is set free, provided he or she accepts the offering made on his or her behalf. In relation to the sinner, the cross is a substitution. And quite simply, Jesus died in your place, in my place. The first man perhaps to realise the truth of substitution at the cross was Barabbas. He was the first man to go free, knowing that Jesus had died as his substitute in his place. That if, Barabbas, if Jesus had not died, Barabbas would have died. Jesus was innocent, and we are not. And yet it was he who took our place on that cross instead of us. Christ died for our sins. Because he was man, he has acted as our substitute and borne the load of human guilt. Human guilt. Who amongst us has not felt guilty? I know I certainly have. And if it's not for the cross of Christ, I would, be, I would still be in that guilt and uncleansed. But because of the cross of Christ, I rest my faith in him alone. His mercy has cleansed me of that guilt and washed me clean. I didn't deserve it. I'm not worthy of it. 
but I can receive it. And when those guilt feelings come back, or those memories <coughs> come back, which they do from time to time, I need to remind myself, God says, I will remember your sins no more. I've forgiven them. Jesus really is your saviour. Don't think you've sinned too much for his blood. There's always a fresh start in Jesus and his grace. And I know that when I've repented and put my faith in Jesus, that's the truth. That I've got to remind myself of that. And be encouraged by brothers and sisters who will remind me of that. And because Jesus was divine, as well as human. That sacrifice of his is eternal in its effect and never needs to be added to or repeated. It's effective. And you know, when you come to the Lord Jesus and you believe in him, it, God, in God's eyes, you're identified with him, you are united with him, and therefore with his cross and resurrection. And you can say, Jesus Christ died for me and I died with him. He rose for me and in him I've been raised with him. Therefore let me live by his grace and help of the Spirit, live accordingly. Yes, as Paul says here in Romans 1, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul is here quoting from an Old Testament prophet, Habakkuk, to substantiate his message. And, and, and basically the situation in the time of the prophet Habakkuk was basically this. God was going to judge the nation of Israel for their idolatry and sins, and the instrument of his judgment was going to be these Babylonians. And in the light of their coming invasion, God spoke through this prophet Habakkuk and in effect said, those who put their faith in me are those who are righteous in my sight and they will not be killed, they will live. Those who put their whole faith in God are safe because in God's sight they are the just, the righteous. And it was from this one phrase that the Reformation came, and it was Martin Luther's text, the just shall live by faith, or the literal translation, the just shall survive by keeping faith. God was saying to Habakkuk, those who go on trusting me will not be destroyed when the Babylonians come. And Paul applies this verse from Habakkuk to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The person who is righteous through faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. Let me share an illustration. The Chinese character for righteousness is most interesting, and I'm told it's composed of two separate characters, one standing for a lamb and the other for me. When lamb is placed directly above me, a new character, Righteousness is formed. This is a helpful picture of the grace of God. Between me the sinner and God the Holy One, there is interposed by faith the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, God's own Son. By virtue of Christ's sacrifice, God now declares righteous those who have faith in Jesus. And so trusting in Jesus, we are no longer in debit, but have the credit of God. And now to close. Putting it simply, Jesus came to take away our badness and to give us his goodness. And this becomes ours through faith in him. And this is what Paul here calls a righteousness from God, or the righteousness of God. He says in the gospel, the righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. 
brothers and sisters, in this gospel we're not ashamed. And let us, with the help of the Holy Spirit, endeavour to make this gospel known to other people. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you that in your love, grace and mercy you gave your only Son to take our badness on the cross and to give us his goodness. May your grace keep transforming us and your spirit enabling us to share this gospel with others for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen.